Hello, my name is Darren Morgan and I'm a violinist originally from Belfast. I'm going to speak to you today about the violin and Baroque music written for it. So the Baroque genre is a period in music we know to be from approximately 1600 to 1750, although in architecture and in art the Baroque genre came slightly earlier. I mention architecture firstly because I'd like you to think about in particular Baroque fountains when you listen to the slow music that I play later and I hope the music and my playing of it conveys something of the exuberant splendour of both this architecture and the musical exuberance and splendour. So of course this is the Baroque genre is music of intensity, it's music of tension and movement. It comes after the Renaissance period which was music of repose and restraint. I'd like to begin by talking a little bit about the violin Nobody knows exactly where the violin came from. It seems to have arrived pretty much fully developed in the middle of the 16th century in uh, Middle Italy. And one of the first real master luthiers was the godfather figure of violin making, Andre Amati. If you travel from Sweden to Iran and on to China, you'll see something of instruments that are very much based on, on the violin. For instance, in Sweden, you've got the key fiddle, in Iran, the Comanche, and in China, a bowed string instrument like the Erhu. All, they have a narrative of violin music and violin playing about them. So to my instrument, and there should be a lovely picture that arrives on your screen now, I play a beautiful violin made in 1848 by the wonderful Italian maker Giuseppe Rocca. Rocca studied in Turin with the master luthier Presenda and his golden period I think is roughly 1846 to 1850. His violin comes right in the middle of that period. He led quite a tragic existence. Uh, he was married four times during his lifetime. Unfortunately all these wives passed away on him. Uh, his son Enrico from his third marriage also became a violin maker. Originally Rocca was a baker, in fact, before he began making violins, and he met a tragic death. He um, was drunk in, uh, and fell into a well in, inebriated in Genoa. So this is Rocca. He was reputed to be the person who found out the, the absolute secrets of Stradivari's varnish, that is, the varnish that made Strad's instruments sound so special. And Rocca, in fact, used a Strad model, the Strad Messiah, uh, to base my violin on. Let's talk a little bit about the pieces I'm going to play for you today. But beforehand, a little bit about pitch. So nowadays, concert pitch is what we call and A equals 440 hertz. That is, the note A above middle C in the piano to reverberate 440 times per minute. Back in the 1600 to 1750 period, the Baroque genre, the note A was definitely lower than this. And we know that it was around about hertz A equals 415. So it was lower. It was more like a modern sounding G sharp and it was less tense than it is nowadays. I'm going to play for you, first of all, a piece from 1735 from Germany, the wonderful composer George Philipp Telemann. And I'm going to use for that a Baroque bow. Baroque bows are shorter than a modern violin bow. They're more curved at the top, as you can see, and they're lighter, making an ethereal sound. Before I play the complete piece for you, I'd like you to look at the excerpt uh, that's annotated on your screen and talk a little bit about the opening of this piece. It's written Fantasia for violin on a bass, violin without bass. But in fact, Telemann, as Bach will, we'll find out later as well, writes very much a bass line into this music. If you listen to the opening bar, if you listen just for the opening E flat, later in the bar a D quaver, and the beginning of bar two a C, you hear something of this bass line that you, a basso continuum would play, something like this. So that's just those notes, the opening of this dolce movement. And if I add the melody to it, this is this 
first movement from the seventh Fantasia. George Philippe Telemann, Fantasia number no. 7. So I'm going to pick up a different bow for the next piece and this is a wonderful bow by the French maker Alfred Lamy from the end of the 19th century. They say if you have a, an Italian violin and a French bow you're doing pretty well. I'm very lucky to have both. And I'm going to go to Venice in Italy and talk about the wonderful Italian composer from the rock genre, Antonio Vivaldi, probably one of the most famous composers ever in fact, and I'm going to play for you a little bit of probably his most famous piece, Summer from La Quattro Stagioni, The Four Seasons. But before I play it, I want to talk to you a little bit about um, Vivaldi. So I mentioned architecture earlier, and you'll see a, a beautiful photograph I took from a church in Venice where Vivaldi worked. This is the Santa Maria della Pieta in Venice. Vivaldi worked there as a priest. He was deemed a priest in 1703 and he worked and took care of the orphans. It was an orphanage. And if any of them showed aptitude, he gave them musical training and wrote compositions for them. So, to summer from the Four Seasons. Vivaldi, just like a much later composer, Richard Strauss, was a programmatic composer with this music, and he wrote sonnets for these pieces. This is what he wrote for the opening of summer in his poetry. During the period of the baking sun, man and beast languish, and the pine trees burn. The cuckoo begins to sing. Now, I know that it has been documented that Vivaldi suffered terribly from asthma and you can nearly hear that sense of breathlessness at the opening of this music.
the opening of summer. Later on, in the third movement of summer, Vivaldi talks about the thunder, and you can hear that very clearly in the music. He writes this, his fears are all to justified for thunder shakes the heavens and breaks down the corn. He's referring to this. exciting movement, the third movement from Summer by Antonio Vivaldi. So I'm going to go back five years earlier to 1720 and uh, back to Germany to Curtin where the wonderful composer Johann Sebastian Bach was working. Bach wrote in 1726 sonatas and partitas for solo violin. There's something of a violinist's bible we keep returning to throughout our musical life. I'm going to play you two movements, the opening adagio uh, from the G minor uh, sonata and then later the prelude from the E major partita. All of the sonatas are in very formulaic uh, structure, four movements, and the partitas, they have lots of dance-inspired movements, for example, Corrance, Gigue, Almond, and Sarabands, for example. The Music that you should, you should appear on your screen, first of all, is an, an uh, autograph score from Bach's hand. And I think there's something incredibly beautiful just to look at with this music. It's fastidiously notated in, in the ink of the day. And you can see something of the very obvious architecture and contour in Bach's writing. Just like in the Telemann, where I mentioned the idea of solo violin music, writing music with an inbuilt bass part, if you look at the next um, score, which has been put up on your screen, and if you look at bar six, the second beat, which is an F natural, and then the third beat is an E natural, then the beginning of bar seven, a D natural, followed by a C, B flat, this is, of course, something of a bass line that you should look out for when I play it through. And Bach uses this tool brilliantly and adds the melodic writing um, on top of this. So this is this very, very brooding, dark G minor adagio. It's uh, full of sadness and melancholy, but there's a real sense of opulence, I think, still in the chords, the open movement. I'm going to finish with the prelude from the E major partita, the last of this cycle of six. 
and it's incredible. E major is such a bright key, four sharps, and there is such a virtuosity and positivity in this music. It's full of incredible chord progressions that you'll hear across the virtuosic writing. So this is the prelude from Bach's E major partita. Thank you very much for listening.